In the latter half of the 16th century, under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, England emerged as the world's first real superpower. Elizabethan England also saw the birth of an aristocratic etiquette so bizarre, it makes even the most stringent and alien rituals of historical decorum seem totally reasonable by comparison. So, today we're going to take a look at the strange and absurd rules of Elizabethan manners. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other eras of etiquette you would like to hear about. Okay, time to do this thing up proper. The Elizabethan era stretched from 1558 to 1603. During that period of English history, proper manners were more than just how you addressed higher classes or how you picked up your fork. Sure, those things were part of it, but in a greater sense, manners were the sum total of a person's social actions, taste and fashion, and sense of refinement. Even the skill with which someone danced could be lumped in with the perception of their manners. Hmm. Huh. Would the electric slide be considered good or bad manners? In Elizabethan society, receiving praise for good manners was the highest compliment that could be paid. And if word got around that you had bad manners, it meant being ostracized from proper society, which really and truly sucked. It was a fate that brought not only shame, but real social and economic consequences. So, farting during chamber recital could not only be uncouth, but could actually affect your livelihood. We chiefly associate the rigid manners of the Elizabethan era with the upper class. And when it came to matters of decorum, the wealthy did have more to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. But what many don't realize is that even the poorest children were taught the importance of proper social behavior, while still very young. From the ages five to seven, most English boys were enrolled in local petty schools, where proper manners were taught alongside basic language skills and so-called good Christian values. These lessons were reinforced over the course of a rigorous 12 to 13 hour day schedule, as well as through liberally applied beatings. Because any lesson worth learning is worth punching. This intense indoctrination to basic Elizabethan etiquette was intended to help the young not only conform to society, but also respect the rigid formula of manners the nobility followed. Dinner was a complicated affair, with more choreography to keep track of than a synchronized swimming team. But we've prepared a helpful cheat sheet to guide you through a formal dinner the next time you find yourself in 16th century England. Keep your elbows off the table. Make sure your hands and nails are clean before sitting down. Absolutely wear tails and make sure they're an even length. Do not blow on your food. Take your hat off. Resist the temptation to stroke any dogs or cats that pass by. Don't scratch yourself. And when in doubt, just try to be as rigid as possible, like a polite robot. And avoid anything a normal human being would consider comfortable or fun. Because eating is arguably the most embarrassing thing that we all do in public, Table manners were extremely important in Elizabethan England. The sheer volume of books, periodicals, and children's literature of the era focusing on table manners is a clear indication of their importance in Elizabethan society, and also that Elizabethan publishers knew how to shamelessly exploit an opportunity when they saw one. In Elizabethan England, there were piles of rules governing the ways in which men could interact with each other which is not totally unusual. Many male activities have rules, like rugby. But there were even more rules that dictated how a man would behave when meeting a woman. And there were also a ton of rules informing women how they could speak and act around other women. Strangely though, there was almost nothing in the way of rules to guide women in how to interact with men in public. This may be due to the assumption that proper women would only need to interact with other women, which was considered ideal behavior. Ideals aside, women obviously had to interact with dudes from time to time, and the lack of regulation made these interactions, at best, kind of awkward. At worst, Elizabethan society put the power largely in the hands of the man, which meant a woman had to either let him play out the script or risk being shunned because of her bad manners. In modern society, the practice of kissing one's own hand as a sign of deference and reverence for the upper class has pretty much gone entirely out of fashion. 
Even when James Brown did it, he wasn't doing it to pay tribute to high society. He did it to kiss James Brown. During the height of Queen Elizabeth's rule, however, it was highly encouraged. In fact, forgetting to kiss your hand made you look like a graceless jerk. The practice of kissing one's hand as a means of public deference was so common that some writers of the period actively complained about people going overboard with a gesture, which does sound pretty annoying. Anytime someone found themselves in the presence of a cultural superior, good Elizabethan taste dictated that they remove their hat. And removing your hat is still generally considered a sign of respect to this day, especially if it's one of those party naked hats. Of course, this being the Elizabethan era, it wasn't as simple as just getting the thing off your head. That would be way too easy. No, you had to take it off in the exact right way and then hold it in a respectable manner, or you would be perceived as a big time jabroni. So what was the right way to get one's hat off? Well, gentlemen needed to grab their hat by the brim with their right hand and then drop their arm directly. Then they had to pretend to kiss their left hand because that was the hand believed to belong to the heart. Boy, these people were really focused on the hand kissing. Once the hat was off, it had to be held facing the right thigh so as to cover up a potentially sweaty hat band. Any person who was hoping to take a few steps up the social ladder in Elizabethan England would eventually need to meet old Liz herself. There was, of course, a comedically rigid series of steps required to display your respect for the Queen. After all, you can't just go into a royal audience and start telling Her Majesty knock-knock jokes. But on second thought, maybe you could. These rules were not just serving the Queen's inflated ego, however. They were intended to keep the monarch safe. So when you approached the queen, you had to make sure that you kept your hands down at your sides. If you were wearing a cloak or riding cape, it was important to see that it was an even length on both sides. And when you knelt before the queen, to grab it with your hands and hold it slightly aloft. This seemingly irrational and ostentatious display was actually meant to assure the monarch and her extremely zealous and violent guards that visitors weren't trying to hide a weapon. The various bows were meant to not only display their reverence, but also to show the guards you weren't packing ye old heat. In Elizabethan England, the right side was considered a place of honor, while the left side was for the masses. When meeting the queen for the first time, visitors were compelled to kneel several times after entering the room before actually reaching the monarch's presence. At each bow, people were instructed to keep the queen on their right side, lest she be led to believe that their visitor had notions of superiority. And while you might think the queen would always occupy center stage, the monarch was often seated just to the right of center at banquets and formal functions, in order to signify her prominent place in society. Among the upper class, fashion was an integral part of proper manners. In fact, fashion was used as a means of showing off your trend-setting taste and social status. Think of those goofy costumes everyone wears to the Met Gala. As a result, there were plenty of rules regarding which types of clothing could be worn by various social classes at public functions. Royalty, for example, were the only people allowed to wear clothes trimmed with fur, because fur is extremely kingly. For the nobility, silk and velvet in bright colors symbolized your family's prosperity, and they didn't detract from the monarch's pelts, which is something you definitely didn't want to do. Because interactions between noblemen and women had the potential for scandal, the rules concerning it went down to the most minute detail. They even went so far as to instruct young ladies on where they should direct their eyes during social events. One authority of the time wrote, Sometimes during a dance, some new brides and other ladies cast their eyes so low that the gentleman cannot tell which of them has been invited to dance, so that one rises to his feet rather than the other. Sometime, in their great eagerness to dance, the men all give her their hands, with the result that the lady does not know which one to take. To avoid such misunderstandings, the writer recommended that a lady keep her eyes level, and when she chooses to invite some gentleman, to look at him directly, so that those sitting near to or behind him will not need to rise, thus avoiding any ensuing scandal. In other words, make direct eye contact with your intended dance partner, so no one has to be embarrassed. Men who entered the same room as royalty were often compelled to perform a kind of one-person dance of loyalty. 
which may be a rule we should bring back. According to the 1600 work Nobilita di Dame by Italian Renaissance dancing master Fabrizio Caroso, when you appear before a king you should immediately make a grave reverence, then take four or six steps forward and make another. And when you are a short distance from his majesty, make the last one very low, pretending to kiss the king's knee. So you were basically expected to do the boot scoot and boogie and place a fake smooch on the king's kneecap. Silly? Maybe. But there's no greater flex than requiring everyone who meets you to do a little jig before they're allowed to speak. All these rules might make Elizabethan society sound like a living hell. But in reality, manners were only really in play when the upper class was interacting with the lower class. Among equals, typical manners were observed in a kind of loose shorthand. If you met a friend on the street, for example, you might touch the brim of your hat as opposed to taking it off completely. People who observed manners with too much enthusiasm risked ridicule. According to one roughly contemporary writer, those who make too many reverences lose just as much favor in the eyes of others as they think to gain, for their blandishments only displease and bore them. And that's good advice in any era. So what do you think? Would you have been able to follow the rules of Elizabethan manners? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.